Good evening to all the participants present here for the second lecture of uh, the Tiblane lecture series on orthography development for Tibetan Burman languages. Uh, with us, we have today our uh, resource person and speaker, Pro Professor Tim Brooks from the Endangered Languages um, Alphabets uh, Project. And uh, before he begins his talk, I would like to request our chairperson for today, Dr. Bobita Sarangpim, uh, to be the chairperson and to um, announce that session as open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manali, for giving me this uh, golden opportunity to chair the session. Uh, I take this uh, opportunity to express our gratitude to our resource person, Mr. Tim Brook. And um, before we begin the session, let me introduce to all our participants in today's session here. Uh, we are joining here with our distinguished speaker, uh, Tim Brook, uh, was born in England and educated at Oxford. Since 1980, he has lived in Vermont in the Northeastern United States. Uh, he has spent most of his life as a writer, guitarist and soccer coach. But in 2009, he began carrying letters and words in wood, which developed into his endangered alphabet projects. Mention may be made that many Northeastern uh, languages, uh, or as you say, Tibeto Burman languages of Northeast India, uh, mentions like uh, Meipe Meik, Tangsa, Zhou language, uh, he has worked on it. And all over in India, the language of Santali, uh, such as Old Chiki, then uh, Tolong uh, Siki, and many languages uh, from Southeast Asia, uh, namely uh, Ainu from Japan is something uh, we, he, he has also worked on it. And in uh, many uh, countries like uh, US, Maldives, Africa, uh, Indonesia, Middle East, Asia, and then to know, and there's a long list which he has worked on it. For that to, more, to know more, uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, introduce uh, our participant. You can log in at Atlas of Endangered Al Alphabets, where you can know the various uh, languages which he had uh, worked on it. And uh, one aspect of the project, uh, his online Atlas of Endangered Alphabets, has been viewed by more than 200,000 people from 200 countries. Uh, uh, he has also uh, been directly involved in indigenous languages and scripts, which is the topic of his talk today. Uh, um, now, uh, may I uh, request our speaker to uh, put on uh, his talk on this today's topic. Uh, over to you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, that uh, kind and, and gracious um, uh, introduction and welcome. I am so delighted to, to be here. I want to give a, a particular thanks to uh, Dr. Monali um, for having uh, not only uh, arranged all of this, but made sure that I was awake in time for um, to, to give the talk um, this morning, which she did uh, very politely and graciously. Um, and uh, I also want to make uh, another um, another thanks, which is I want to uh, recognize um, that the uh, the land that I'm speaking to you from um, is the ancestral land of the Abnaki people, um, who of course predate um, Europeans in, in this area of the world. Um, and I'm very pleased to say that right now, in fact, I'm working uh, with the Abnaki to develop uh, curricular materials and videos um, so that um, school children in Vermont will learn more about uh, the, the land that, um, that they now live on and uh, that, uh, about which they know very, very little to this point. So, um, uh, when I was invited to speak about orthography, um, I, was, I was hesitant because um, I've now worked, um, as you were kind enough to say, with uh, 50 or 60, probably more, 
different um, indigenous and minority communities around the world. And in all of those conversations over 10 years, I've only ever heard somebody from one of those communities using the word orthography once. And so I thought this is very strange. Um, and so what, what my um, PowerPoint is gonna be about really sort of goes after the question of, um, of this word. And you may think that sounds extremely boring and academic and, um, and I, I hope not. And I, I, I suspect not. So um, we're gonna go ahead and look at this. Um, so um, can I have a little um, a confirmation? You can in fact see my first slide, two cheers for orthography. Someone say yes. 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 Excellent, thank you, good. All right, now we go. Um, so two cheers obviously suggests this, there's a, a, a qualified approval. So one of the reasons why I am so interested in this subject and I'm delighted that you're talking about this subject is that linguists typically do not talk about writing. Um, so we've got some quotes here, Ferdinand de Saussure, Swiss um, uh, linguist, very, very influential. A language and its written form constitute two separate systems of signs. The sole reason for the existence of the latter is to represent the former. The object of study in linguistics is not the combination of the written word and the spoken word. It is the latter alone. In other words, the spoken word. And then a Bloomfield goes on to say this is early 20th century. Language is basically speech. Writing is of no theoretical interest. Jacques Derrida, writing is the wandering outcast of linguistics. So straight away, the fact that many of you are working on the question of how do we introduce writing? How do we foster writing? How do we help um, bring writing into a community that, um, that may not write or that may use um, a writing system that doesn't really work for them? That's a, a remarkable position to be in. <laughs> Excuse me, and and I want to um, I want to praise you for making that endeavor, especially as the tradition in linguistics is that this is not an endeavor anyone should undertake. I have had numerous graduate students saying to me they wanted to study writing systems, but their supervisor told them not to. Said that it was a dead end, that it was professional suicide. I say the reverse, and my talk is really gonna illustrate this. I say we are at the beginning of serious consideration of writing. Um, okay, next, whoops. Uh, I guess we'll use this method here instead. So as my guideline for how to address this, I go with Article 13 of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which I believe was uh, passed in 2007. Indigenous peoples have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their histories, languages, oral traditions, philosophies, writing systems, and literatures and to designate and retain their own names for communities, places, and persons. So as I say, this um, non-binding resolution was passed in 2007. I do not know <coughs> a single country in the world that abides by this declaration wholeheartedly and that um, supports and promotes these rights at a level that is equal to the rest of the population. Um, it, is, it is a fascinating situation and a fascinating challenge. So the word orthography is, is a really interesting word. Um, it comes from um, Greek, Latin, Old French. Um, correct writing, sometimes translated as correct spelling. And in fact, some people use the word orthography simply to mean spelling. 
Um, I'm going to look at it and, uh, and, and raise some other questions about this particular word. Um, in particular, the notion of correct is a very strange notion because who is deciding on the correctness? And what is correct at one moment may not be correct at another moment. Um, I heard, recently heard a wonderful story about a tablet that was found in Pompeii in, you know, in Italy, uh, the, the city that was buried under the volcanic um, eruption. And in this tablet, uh, there's some writing and somebody else, another hand, has gone through and made corrections. And those corrections were grammatically correct. Um, the person who was writing originally was presumably writing in some kind of a regional language or dialect. But interestingly enough, the one that survived the, uh, the eruption and survived history was actually the more vernacular form. Writing tends to be at the conservative end of the spectrum, speech tends to move quite rapidly. So the whole notion of correct writing becomes an issue of authority. And one of the things I realized, this is something really like, that occurred to me literally two days ago, is that the word orthography lives almost exclusively at the point of intersection between those who have and use writing and those who have not or do not. So um, people in communities where there is um, and has been a standard set of writing for centuries almost never use the word orthography. The word orthography is almost exclusively used in the field of linguistics to talk about that point of intersection between those who have writing and use it and those who don't. And here is a great example. It's actually a tibeto burman example. This is just a screen grab of a paper uh, by David Bradley. Many of you, I'm sure, know David Bradley, great um, Australian scholar of, of Chinese uh, language and culture and script. And language policy for Chinese, China's minorities, orthography, orthography development for the Yi. And this is a really interesting thing right there because the Yi had their own orthography and the Chinese government decided it needed to be rationalized and organized and simplified. So you have an uneven status of authority. You have a government and you have a people. And interestingly enough, from what I know about the Yi script, even after there was orthography developed for the script, the Yi continue to um, write it and use it in many, many different ways. And um, so the idea of imposing a particular way of writing Yi has not really been the success the government might have hoped it would be. So when we have this situation where a, a culture with writing intersects with a culture that doesn't have writing, it is a time of great vulnerability. Um, there is inequality of power, which may well lead to a potentially unequal exchange. And of course, I'm not talking about the work that you're doing. I'm talking about, for example, the work the British. So forgive me, I British. I know a little bit about what the British did in India um, and elsewhere in the world. And the exchange was, we give you an orthography so that you can therefore be more civilized and you give us natural resources and cheap labor. That to me sounds like a fairly unequal exchange. And what's more, the terms of the exchange are being dictated by the powerful rather than the less powerful. And I'm gonna suggest that however anybody moves forward in terms of this um, transaction of writing, um, the goal, and I'm taking this again from uh, the UN resolution. The goal is equality and respect, not paternalism and condescension. 
Um, and I have, you know, many documents from uh, the, not only the British um, occupation of India, but also uh, the work of missionaries, for example, where the, uh, the language used to describe the people they were trying to bring writing to was indeed paternalistic and condescending. Um, so, so because you know far more about um, the development of writing systems in um, South Asia than I do, I'm going to give you some examples from elsewhere in the world. So here we have Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights translated into Lakota Sioux. And as you'll see, what we have is essentially an extension of Latin um, alphabet with all kinds of diacritical marks here, there, and everywhere to the point where if I were trying to read that and pronounce it, I certainly couldn't guarantee that I had got it right. But most, the vast majority of um, uh, Native American tribes um, have, uh, have come to use a Latin-based orthography that was either introduced by missionaries or was introduced by a uh, government in, in some form. Um, and I'm going to suggest that this really is a kind of annexation. Um, and it's like planting a flag to say, we now own this territory. So here is, is kind of an interesting and odd example from the 19th century, when, of course, a great deal of this was going on. In the fall of 1859, Jacob Hamlin led a group of men to the Hopi villages located in what is now northeastern Arizona. So Arizona is in the southwest of the United States. It's an area that at the time in 1859 would have been uh, very um, unwesternized and undeveloped. And significantly, it's also very close to Utah, where the Mormons um, had established their headquarters. The group was comprised of six men, including Thales H. Haskell and Marion J. Shelton, and they were tasked by Brigham Young, who, of course, was the leader of the Mormons, with establishing relations with Hopi and preparing the way for translation of the Book of Mormon into Hopi. Consequently, notice there is there's no, there's no mention of anything that the Hopi wanted in this. It's all one way. Consequently, Shelton compiled a list of Hopi vocabulary. To do so, he employed the Deseret alphabet, a script developed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in other words, the Mormons, with the intent to improve English spelling. So that's the uh, alphabet that he used for writing the Hopi words and their English equivalents. This focus on sound made the script effective in translating the previously <coughs> unwritten Hopi language, excuse me. However, it was still unable to treat every sound equally. Many were so subtle in English that there wasn't an exact character in Deseret creating an issue if they were more prominent in Hopi. Excuse me a second. So what we have here is a great illustration of the introduction of an, uh, of an orthography, or possibly the introduction of an authority, <coughs> and how the, the two are in fact related. Because here we have this group of Mormons who are trying to establish relationships with the Hopi using an alphabet that doesn't even work particularly well for the English language, let alone another language. So it's not about finding a way of accurately writing a, a language that already exists. It's really, as I say, a way of establishing these are now our people and our intervention with them has made them more Christian, more sophisticated, whatever. Um, it is a, because if someone were to say, you know, the Hopi, they have only have an oral culture, they're illiterate people, the Mormons could say, no, they're not. Look, we have a Hopi Bible or Book of Mormon. So 
the, the transaction that's taking place here, as I say, it's not an equal exchange. And it's a transaction that needs to be undertaken with enormous forethought and also, as I said before, respect. Um, we see the same thing in Africa. Um, and uh, so here we see um, an alphabet that was originally developed in the 1920s. Um, and this is somebody's project to try and represent, ready for this, all African languages with a set of letters that are as close to the Latin alphabet as possible. So even though there are some modifications here, as you can see, essentially it's a Latin-based alphabet. And the idea is that all African languages um, can be spoken with these letters. We know that isn't true, by the way. Um, it's also such an interesting notion that presumably the work on this alphabet, and by the way, this particular version was uh, 50 years later, so people have been working on this alphabet for decades, must have been based on the assumption that it was going to improve the lives of Africans throughout the continent um, to have literacy, but to have literacy in these terms. And again, it's hard not to uh, to see the connection between orthography and authority. Now, of course, especially in recent times, but actually um, going back 200 years, many uh, individuals um, and many African communities have decided uh, they didn't want to uh, write their language in the alphabet of the colonizers who after all were doing some pretty hideous things in various places throughout the continent. And so it's hardly surprising that we have people starting to create their own writing systems, which by the way, are typically less likely to be, regard, to be described as orthographies if they're indigenously created. Because again, there's the question of authority. So here we have the spectacular Mandombe or Mondombe um, script. Um, if you don't know anything about the, the Mandombe or Mandombe script, um, uh, yes, go to endangeredalphabets.net, which is our online atlas of endangered alphabets, and um, click on the alphabets and scroll down to Mondombe or Mandombe, and you will find out all about this. And in fact, the word Mandombe, which was given to this script, means in uh, one of the Congolese languages, because this is roughly speaking from the Congo, it means by the blacks or for the blacks, um, pour les noirs, par les noirs, etc. Um, so there is a very, very strong sense that um, those working on the script and then those who learned the script and use the script want a writing system that is theirs. And I think this is the most important point I want to make the whole time, which is that writing does not simply represent the sounds of speech. It becomes a visual iconography that announces, even when nobody is speaking, that a people is there, they belong there, this is where they live, they have a right to be there. Um, I was in Morocco a couple of years ago, and just recently, um, uh, outside um, uh, the principal airport in Casablanca, the signage uh, was in Tifana, the, the Berber or, or Amazigh script um, for the first time in the airport's history. And even though the majority, not the majority, even though many of the people in, in Morocco and certainly most of the visitors to the airport could not read Tifana, it was pretty clear what it says. It says airport. <coughs> That sign was to the Amazigh people a sign that their existence was being acknowledged. 
and was being acknowledged in a way that was as respectful because the sign was just as big as the sign in um, the Latin alphabet because of, of course the history of French occupation and Arabic because of course the history of Arabic occupation. So the notion of a writing system, and again, this is something that professional linguists believe, its only purpose is to manifest the sound of speech massively misunderstands the role of writing in a community, especially a community that has been marginalized or a community that did not use writing till that point. Writing becomes emblematic. Again, thinking of Morocco, uh, the Amazia flag, which was designed in the 1960s, um, it has three colors on it, which represent um, the, uh, uh, the sky and the, the green land and the desert. But right in the middle of the flag is a letter. It's the letter Yaz. And that letter or its ancestors can be found in stones that have been dug up that were 2000 years old. And so the letter says, this is where we are. This is where we have been and have we were even before the Romans and the French and the, the Arabs. So uh, writing then becomes something very, very important and figuring out how to introduce writing in an equal and respectful fashion becomes uh, um, a really, really interesting challenge. Uh, in short, the term orthography is most often used to give credibility and authority to a script by those who feel that authority is valuable or even necessary. And of course, authority tends to mean an unequal exchange of power. And when we talk about, oh, I'm going to develop an orthography for these people here, what we're really doing is giving credibility to our work and our authority and right to do that work, um, which is a very interesting question because it's a right that is typically um, assumed by the more powerful culture as opposed to granted by the less powerful. So um, I realized that in um, South Asia, there are a number of writing systems that are used to introduce writing to minority cultures. Um, you know more about those than I do, and I'm frankly, I'm hoping you're gonna tell me a bunch about them. Um, I'm gonna stick with what I know, which is uh, the Latin-based orthographies that have been introduced um, by um, uh, military means, uh, for example, in South America um, and in North America for that matter. Um, and also by, um, uh, by missionaries, uh, especially in Africa and in um, Southeast Asia. So why a Latin-based orthography anyway? And, and here I'm saying, so there are many scripts that are more elegant than Latin. This is uh, Taitam or, or Lana from Northern Thailand. It's, a, it's an ancient, um, but still existing um, spiritual script. I think every, uh, the letters are so beautiful. It looks like a, a pond of koi. Um, many scripts are more user-friendly than Latin. In fact, Latin is notoriously hard to learn. So Hangul was designed to be easy to learn and to, to, and to um, uh, vocalize. Uh, many are more accurate. So this is a very recently created syllabary for Amazonian languages. And the thing about syllabaries is that they tend to have more characters, but they have more characters because they are more completely representing the full range of sounds in heavily syllabic languages. And yet, nevertheless, um, there is a tradition in Western linguistics of assuming that syllabaries are just a kind of a way station on the evolution towards um, uh, alphabets, which is such nonsense, I won't even get into it right now. 
There are some scripts that are easy to learn. So this one is from, uh, from up in your way. This is the Wan Shou script um, developed by Ban Wang Lo Su um, in Assam and the surrounding area, I believe. Um, so what we have here is each letter is a, a stylized form of a familiar object. And so the, if everybody, if all the children are going to know what a hornbill looks like or a lion looks like or what the sun looks like, then why not have letters that take on those shapes? And it's so interesting that if you go into an elementary school classroom in England or America, then all around the room you see um, pictures, right? So there'll be a picture of an apple and then it will, there'll be an A and then underneath it, it will say apple. And the thinking is, okay, the, the kids are gonna recognize an apple. And so they are going to associate it with that word and that letter. And I'm thinking, uh, wouldn't it be better if the letter actually looked like an apple? Uh, there's a bit of a cognitive leap you're asking those kids to make. So here you have a script that, um, uh, that really makes that cognitive leap. There are many um, indigenously created scripts that are really deeply embedded in their visual culture, especially in Africa. Um, and so here we have on the right, uh, this remarkable um, syllabic script, Ditema um, Sadenoko, uh, which is closely based on traditions of house painting and decoration. Um, and so you may well say, you know, writing, house painting, like what's the connection? And in order to understand the connection, you have to understand that one of the purposes of writing, especially for an indigenous or minority people, is to reinforce the sense that they deserve a place on the earth. And so this script is a way of in echoing these house painting traditions um, of saying, um, we have our own culture. We have been here for centuries. We are a people that deserves respect, not least because we have developed such a, um, a unique and fascinating visual culture. And for a, uh, as I say, for a, a, a minority group or for an indigenous group in a colonized region, that is extraordinarily important, something that um, linguists tend to undervalue um, enormously. There are many scripts that are spiritually richer. This is one of my uh, endangered alphabets carvings. This is Siddham. And in, in the Siddham script, which is used in Shingon Buddhism, Every syllable has an implied spiritual value and meditating on specific uh, syllables can lead to physical healing, spiritual healing, enlightenment. That's a very different attitude toward writing than saying we want a letter that represents that sound and that's it. Or to say that the purpose of writing is to record data. What that really shows is that our own view of writing, and by our own, I'm pointing to myself here and talking about the West, has become spiritually devalued to the point where it is seen as. Um, a sort of mechanical product rather than something which, as I say, is spiritually richer. There are many scripts that are more calligraphic than the Latin alphabet. So this is a piece of calligraphy by my friend Tamir, who's one of the top callig Mongolian calligraphers in the world. And one of the things that is absolutely fascinating about the Mongolian script is that each letter can be represented in three different ways, which sounds confusing, but it isn't, because the way those three different ways are what the letter looks like if it's at the beginning of a word, 
what the letter looks like if it's in the middle of a word and what the letter looks like if it's at the end of the word. And the initials and finals, as they're called, as opposed to medials, are really much more elaborate. The medials, we can see these little squiggles in the middle, um, they tend to be much uh, swifter and more perfunctory. And so what this means is that every time you write a word in the Mongolian script, it begins with this elaborate swoosh and it ends with this different elaborate swoosh. It is an alphabet which in itself encourages expressiveness of writing. So the Latin alphabet has only come to dominate the world, not because it is the best alphabet or the most universal alphabet or because um, it makes sense for any other reason. It's only come to dominate the world because at various crucial moments, it had more lawyers, guns or money than some other script. I have this saying, I don't think I'm going to put this in here, but no. I have this saying, which is that history is written by the winners, um, which of course you've heard, but I then go and say in the alphabet of the winners. And it's fascinating to see um, 19th century English writing at the time when the British Empire was at its um, most expanded, which writes about the English language and or the Latin alphabet as if that is the pinnacle of civilization and intellectual um, reasoning. In fact, there, are, there was a, for a long time, there was an argument that because the Chinese writing was not alphabetic, it meant that the Chinese could not possibly think abstract thoughts, which is much to come as a surprise to the Chinese, given that Confucius was writing philosophy when people in Northern Europe weren't writing anything at all. So I'm then asking myself the question, so why is it that there is such a tradition of assuming that if you're going to, going to encourage writing in a new community, you should introduce an orthography rather than encourage the development of an indigenous writing system. Um, and it turns out that, again, in the field of linguistics, there are some very entrenched biases. So this is from my friend Piers Kelly, who is one of the very few scholars who actually does field research in minority writing systems. Um, and in talking about minority created writing systems, he, in, in one of his papers, the link is here, um, he talks about the fact that his colleagues in the field of linguistics and also anthropology um, really are not interested in indigenously created writing systems. In conversation, some colleagues have expressed the view that they are not real scripts and that there are endangered scripts and languages that deserve more documentary attention from researchers. Others have pointed out that if that recent secondary scripts, so this is the word that's professionally used sometimes, are rarely successful, especially if success is measured by the extent of the diffusion of the script and its transmission over multiple generations. So right at the beginning, we heard about um, the Alchiki script for um, Santali. That is one of the very few that um, has achieved um, widespread use and legal status. Most don't. And interestingly enough, um, linguists typically tend to say, well, that's because they weren't good scripts or they weren't necessary scripts. Um, I'll, we'll come back to them in a second. Uh, another objection, this is Piers Kelly saying again, is that the scripts themselves are often structurally cumbersome and that they simply add a distraction to the more important goals of orthography development for minority languages and ultimately literacy in these languages. And see how once again, the word orthography there is a word that is being used by scholars and administrators. Um, and the goal is obviously to introduce literacy, but 
the assumption is that you're going to do that more successfully if you introduce an orthography that already exists that represents authority and that can be modified to fit different languages. There are other objections I've heard. Um, this was in a conversation about um, indigenous scripts in West Africa. Um, this was actually, I think, the Deputy Ministry of, Minister of Education of one of these countries saying, oh, um, these indigenous scripts, they're the work of activists and troublemakers. And then some, it, it, almost in the same breath, he said, they're the work of outsiders, and then um, another person said, oh, they're the work of individuals simply seeking to gain attention or to make money from their inventions. So there's, there's some serious dissing of indigenous scripts. Um, another one, which I forgot to even mention here is that, and you hear this in West Africa a lot, if we are to be taken seriously on the world stage, we cannot represent ourselves in our own language and or script. Um, and the, the uh, argument is that it makes us sound primitive. Um, if we speak French, we sound sophisticated. If we speak Yoruba, we sound primitive. Um, and then if it's an indigenous script, it looks even more primitive. Um, and of course, there's the problem that nobody else can read it. So again, what you have really here is an imbalance of power. And um, uh, the objections to endangered languages, which I know many of you are working on, and um, indigenous endangered scripts are for many of the same reasons. So what I propose, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we're calling a new script incubator. So one of the challenges that faces somebody who wants to create a writing system that works for their community, their language community, is that the skills required to do that activity may well not be the same skills that are necessary to teach it, for example, or to work with local leaders to get it accepted or at least discussed. And so consequently, the, someone may go to years and years of, of effort to create a script, which could quite well work, um, and winds up in isolation. Um, they're teaching it with a, a blackboard and chalk or, or a chart that they use and they put up on the wall in the street. And I know of at least three scripts of this kind, which will almost certainly die out with the death of their creator. That doesn't mean they're a bad idea. What it means is that the process of introducing that idea and developing that idea does not yet exist. And this is something that I've actually heard from a number of people in Northeastern India, in that corner of South Asia in, in general, is that people are coming to them, uh, to colleagues of mine, people I know, and saying, we want to develop this script, how do we do it? And there is no pathway, there's no paradigm, there's no safe space to do it. Um, and so um, I am gonna propose something called the new script incubator. But before I do that, I want to introduce to you the world premiere I need to know how to do this. Okay. The world premiere of um, an animation that my organization made um, as part of something we're doing called the Red List Project, which is an effort to identify every script currently at use in the world and to assess the degree of its health and vitality or threat. And so one of the things that we did um, was to look at uh, which is the one I'm looking for, this one here, uh, was to look at um, script um, loss and decay, but we also looked at script creation. And if I've queued this up properly, you are going to see the world premiere of a short video that we made specifically um, about your area in the world. 
Okay, um, so uh, we know already that that, um, that animation is, is out of date and we're gonna have to keep on updating it because uh, new scripts are being invented all the time. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. So now I wanna talk about what, what can be done when a, a new script is created within its community to uh, ensure that um, if it is of, of use and value, um, it actually can be um, put into operation. So uh, this, the new script operator would need to have a number of steps built into it. So first of all, um, we would need to have people who can provide professional technical evaluation of the new script in terms of its ability to fully represent the spoken language and assistance as requested. And for example, this is what um, Stephen Morey has done with a couple of um, scripts that have been um, developed uh, in Tangsa and uh, Wancho um, providing that um, technical evaluation and support uh, rather than coming in and saying, this is what you have to do. 
Um, so then I think the, the incubator would also need to suggest a range of strategies for working with the language community to assess the script, assess the degree of support, and discuss the possibilities of its eventual adoption. Um, so uh, the Osage script in Oklahoma in the United States, um, the uh, one person um, started developing an, an Osage script and he went to the tribal council and explained it to them. And the tribal council um, saw that this would be a way for the Osage language and the Osage people to be um, represented in a new and powerful way. And also that they felt that this would help save the Osage language from extinction. And so they then became community leaders in ensuring that the script um, developed and, and um, was um, completed uh, with support. Um, offer support from professional font developers and type designers. So yes, um, many of the people who are designing um, scripts these days have so much skills, they themselves know how to create fonts, um, but some don't. Um, and that, especially if you're gonna have a, a digitized font, then that's obviously very important. And that therefore becomes the next step, offer help in digitizing the script and guidance in developing a Unicode proposal. So um, I'm involved in a number of these things happening around the world right now, um, largely on the periphery because this is not my skill set. I just sort of help make things happen. But um, it is the skill set of, for example, Craig Cornelius of Google, who spends much of his time working with minority cultures to help them um, digitize the script and get it ready for our various platforms, such as, um, you know, tablets and phones, because that, that's another set of coding right there. So then um, provide information about best and most successful teaching practices. So um, bless them, I know people who are trying to teach a minority script through a WhatsApp group or through a Facebook group, or even, as I said earlier, with a chart on a street. Um, and uh, teaching is a set of skills, um, and, and it requires um, certain kinds of resources. So again, in my view, the, the new script um, incubator would um, bring in people who are able to make various suggestions about how the script might best be taught to its community. Um, discuss physical or online publication and promotion strategies that might be suitable for the particular script and its community. So um, more and more new scripts are actually making their first appearance on YouTube. Uh, which has the great ability to be a, a teaching tool um, that is extremely portable. So it means, for example, that if you're in a culture that has been widely scattered as a result of you know, economic misfortune or military invasion, then people in the diaspora, those scattered around all over the world, can stay in touch with their ancestry, their culture, their people, their cousins, um, uh, by continuing to, uh, to learn uh, this script um, through YouTube, uh, to communicate through social media channels. And this is my favorite, create a resource team of people who have created, championed, or taught a new or emerging script, who can speak from experience about the challenges involved and strategies that have been successful. So I regularly have conversations with, I don't know, maybe 14 people at this point who have created a script for their people. And um, the more I can do to help them talk to each other and talk to people who are looking to develop their own indigenous script, the more the, uh, the value of their uh, experiences can be uh, brought to bear. So um, one of the most famous and successful newly created scripts, right at the beginning of its life, one of its authors was thrown in jail for being a troublemaker. Um, so talking to new script authors or creators about 
how to deal with the fact that their work may make them unpopular, at least for a while, with the authorities, that's a pretty important issue right there. Okay, so uh, we're getting to the end here. Um, I thought I'd let you know that I am running a Kickstarter campaign right now. Um, I have a new book that I'm in the process of writing, which encompasses many of the ideas I've just spoken about and more. Um, and if you have the means to support this Kickstarter, there is the link. Um, because it's new and unusual, it means that conventional publishers won't handle it. So as always, I'm going to publish it myself. See, I have the spirit of a new script creator, just like that. Um, and now I'm throwing this open to, to all of you. Questions, comments, suggestions. <laughs> Funding opportunities, if you have any ideas of uh, where we can get funding from to create our new script incubator, that would be great. I will leave you with our logo. Um, endangeredalphabets.com is our home website. Endangeredalphabets.net is the website for the interactive atlas of endangered alphabets. I am now going to stop sharing my screen so I can see you all. And I would love to hear about the work you're doing, the issues that you're facing, and questions and suggestions. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a question from Kellen, Kellen Parker Van Dam. Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, Tim. Thank you for that. Uh, we exchanged emails back oh, in 2013, yeah, yeah. actually, uh, when Whoa! I was involved in Phonemica in China, and you contacted me about some scripts back then. So nice to finally put a face and voice to that email address. Wow, um, I'm sorry I'm so much older now than I was then. <laughs> yeah, aren't we all? Aren't we all? Uh, so thank you for that. I, I do have a couple uh, sort of quick questions. First of all, I yeah. really appreciated you mentioning Laku Moshang, uh, the late Laku Moshang for the Tangsa yes. Moshang script. Uh, yes. A quick addition to that, this script is now mm -hmm. currently being adapted by the Tongsa script development committee for use from yep. multiple different Tongsa languages. I'm sure you know this, um, but this is something that is ongoing and it's, it's um, this is the community that I work with most directly. I've since moved from China to Northeast India. Uh, as and, a, and that, by the way, is a great example of Stephen Mori essentially functioning as the kind of script incubator that mm -hmm, yep. you're talking about, except that not everybody has the, the stamina to, to do it as as one person. Yeah, oh, well, sadly, these days, neither does Stephen. Uh, I was his PhD student and have taken over much ah, of his work. So oh, uh, I've actually next. been working with Lakum since 2015 yes. until his passing and also Ban Wang Mosu, yes. who you mentioned is a good friend of mine yes, who I've yes. worked with as well. Uh, we have Mosel who just turned on his camera, who has developed the Roman orthography for his language as well that is in sort of widespread use. So fortunately, Northeast India is a really good place that that this is going on. Th there's, wait, there's sort of wait, a... Wait. Wait a yeah. second. You're talking so quickly. I need to say something here, which is Please. great work. I, I'm just delighted that you've picked up on Stephen's work and that um, you know, you're know you involved in these communities in a way which is clearly informed but and skilled, but also respectful and egalitarian, which I think Absolutely. is no, a, 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 way to, a way to go. And as you mentioned, this is hugely important. And I mean, I think that you were maybe as a linguist, I'm a little defensive. So I feel that you were a little unfair to linguists about not respecting sort of the importance culturally of scripts. But fortunately, people like David Bradley, who is also a professor of mine, yeah. and many of the other people who are working in the area, Shabana Chilia, uh, and people just generally working in the Northeast tend to be a lot more receptive to this kind of thing. So fortunately, this is definitely an issue that you run into in places like the US, but it is much less common, certainly with foreign linguists working in Northeast India. Would you would you mind putting your name and contact information in the chat? Yeah, would certainly. Be, because again, I like to try and um, form networks, you know, and the fact that you're doing this and you've been through this, which I'm sure at no point has been easy, means that you're in a great position to help other people um, who might be thinking of doing something similar. Sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I've, I mean, I was helping with Craig Cornelius as well for Ban Wong's uh, sure. Unicode yep. uh, application. The question I have for you is, as you know, generally sort of in the West, there's this notion of a language as a dialect with an army and a navy, this sort of famous quote that Max Weinreich is attributed to. 
A different sentiment that I've run to, into specifically in Arunachal Pradesh is a language is a speech variety that has its own script and a dialect is one that does not. And I don't know mm. how widespread this notion is in the Northeast, but it's certainly something I've run into a lot in Eastern Arunachal Pradesh. So my question for you is with that in mind, how do you foresee a healthy way that people who want to have their own orthography can balance between the sort of assumed urgency of doing this, and urgency is definitely a major factor, yep. balanced with the need for sort of metalinguistically aware uh, phonemic inventories that are very clear. Moselle, I'm sorry, I'm going to use you as an example here. Moselle has done a really good job of coming up with digraphs of Roman letters to represent not just the different vowels that happen in his language in Uipo, but also to resemble some of the tones. The issue is that at a certain point, you run out of possible digraphs to use. Moselle yeah. is fortunately an incredibly savvy, very sort of metalinguistically aware speaker of his language. But many of the people with whom I've worked with, including people like Lakum Moshang, who was yeah. fantastic and really had a good awareness, was also missing a few pieces about um, sort of contrast that might have existed in phonology, things like this. So I can imagine it's very easy for someone to feel pressure to create an orthography come up with something that misses some of the phonemic distinctions, merges right. others, separates some that don't exist, and so on. So how how do you think is a healthy way to approach this kind of need for metalinguistic awareness with the urgency that many people feel? Yeah, so um, a while ago, I got really interested in dowsing. So dowsing, for those who don't know the term, is the process of looking for water or actually for um, information, uh, other things, um, by using um, a variety of extremely simple tools that essentially are just um, almost the extension of what we would call psychic abilities. And this person, dowsing is, is one of the most interesting of the psychic abilities in that it, it, it has proven itself over and over again for, you know, for centuries. So this was, uh, I, I heard about this guy because uh, this was at the time of the um, civil wars that were going on in El Salvador and Nicaragua. And um, he was invited to come down into the rural regions in Central America and help them find water so that they could, um, you know, because obviously, you know, clean water is, is absolutely vital. And so he took with him somebody who had invented a, a um, a very cheap and very simple well digging device. And to me, that is a, and when they left, they left, right? Um, to me, that's a really interesting metaphor because the desire and the need came from the community. The ability to, um, to help in a constructive way did come from outside at the invitation of the community. And it was very clear that when the, um, the help was, uh, was done with, they would leave but would come back if asked, right? And um, uh, it, one of the, the main challenges with um, what I've been calling orthographies is that um, they, they weren't invited in the first place. It wasn't an equal exchange, right? So um, what you say is a great illustration of how it's really valuable to have, for example, an outsider say, you know, in listening to you speak, I noticed there is this tonal thing that doesn't seem to be represented in the glyphs that you've created so far. Do you hear it as well? And they kind of go, oh, yes, we don't use that very often. That's why I hadn't thought about it, you know, so that kind of help absolutely can be extraordinarily valuable. In fact, it was number one on my list of things for the, you know, new script incubator. Mm. Um, the pace that you bring up a really interesting uh, question, which is the pace at which this happens. Um, so um, uh, Herman uh, Mongrain Lookout, who, who, who developed the Osage script, that was 20 years in the making, you know, right. um, and it's, not something that you're going to be able to pull together quickly. And even if you could, you probably shouldn't, because that process of deliberation 
is part of what engages a new idea with its community and reshapes it as necessary until it becomes an idea that fits the community and the community then can support. Yeah, um, but yeah, I think pace of change is something that is rarely discussed, but really, really interesting. Yeah, no, I mean, not to mention, just if I can add one more point, not to mention yeah, yeah. the time it takes, even if you have right now, I guess I'm not speaking directly to Tim, but to sort of everybody else here at this point, but even if you have a perfectly developed orthography and you are ready right now to go, it can still be five years before Unicode adopts it, before it's able to be typed on computers, font creation takes time, you have to tweak them. I mean, I've worked, I worked right. with Lacoon for many years on the, on the Moshang Tongsa script and there are a lot of these sort of conceptions that I think certainly for, you know, someone growing up with computers, in my case, growing up with computers and, and things like this, this sort of clicks, but doesn't quite register necessarily for people who might think, well, look, I have this perfect thing right now. Why doesn't it work? So, right. yeah, it's a very um, time consuming process. So I'm glad that you mentioned actually, that. What you just touched on is, is something else um, that I know has happened in your region, uh, broadly speaking, which is. And, and this is true of um, traditional languages that are languishing or traditional scripts that are languishing, as well as newly created scripts is um, if you have a minority culture or if you have a, a situation where there are only two people left who write a script, one in one village, one in another village, then you're going to get two different scripts. You're going to get stuff where there is considerable local variation. And likewise, um, if you're talking about a region, I'm thinking now of Gurung uh, people in particular, you're going to have varieties within that region. And so the question of how do we come up with a script that works for everybody um, is one that if you try and push it through quickly, you're not going to deal with the political variations, the geographical variations, the climatological variations, the variations, and this is a big one, where some of the people are wealthier and more powerful than some of the others who speak the same language, you know, and so they say, well, we're going with ours, of course, you know. Um, so, yes, this business of the necessarily taking time is no bad thing. And when Unicode sees that, wait a second, you have two proposals essentially here, one from this district and one from this district, we can't go ahead until you resolve those. That frustrates everybody, but it's probably no bad thing that that discussion then has to take place. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you and, th and keep up the good work. Thank you, Kanil. Uh, any other questions from the participant are welcome. Any questions, query? Uncle Musil, case, can, yeah, yeah. I think um, Uncle Musil can also share um, yeah. his experience with the orthography. That would be interesting to yeah. Yeah, really. No, in fact, uh, I don't have uh, that much of uh, experience to share with uh, uh, with uh, all of you, but uh, it has been a very good uh, uh, experience to listen to uh, Sir Tim Brooks. So it makes me uh, a lot of uh, you know addition to my energy to work on the the orthography I am dreaming of. So, and uh, I am very, I am also very thankful to Kellen for taking my name, you know, but <clears throat> see, uh, I am working on the orthography of my Uipol language, but still it is, uh, uh, it is very much uh, in the initial stage. Uh, but still, uh, this uh, Kellen has recognized my work uh, as something, um, uh, some kind of special thing. So I am very thankful. And uh, I learned a lot today from Sir Tim. Um, thank you so much. Um, I could you, first of all, I'm really glad to have given you um, more of a sense of energy and purpose, which is what we all need. Um, 
could you put your name and contact information in the chat? Because I would love to stay in touch. Yes, sure, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. One more question in the chat here. Ah, yes. Yes. Um, yes, so as I understand it, missionaries began moving through northeastern India and into Southeast Asia as early as the early 19th century. It, it's an area that has been... Um, oh, thank you so much for the information. Um, it's an area that has been thoroughly influenced by, um, uh, by missionary workers. And... Um, and so the person in the chat says it's creating a huge issue in writing uniform spelling because not all the Latin script can describe the sounds of our community. Yes, you're right. It's also hindering our community in developing our literary works because nobody wants to write in the local language because of the mismatches in spelling patterns. So um, I believe um, this is true even on a, a larger scale. Um, I was actually listening to a short story by a, a writer um, who wrote in Aria, um, but um, in order to um, have her works sell, a publisher said, no, you, you know, you, you shouldn't use this regional language. You know, you should be writing in, um, in a language that is more appropriate for literature. Um, and uh, yes, so the more we can do to, um, uh, to undermine those prejudices, the better. Um, so, uh, and, and so the person who put this, this question in here, can you kind of share some ideas how to solve this problem in any ways available? Yeah, I think it's going to be a, an increasingly common problem as people in South Asia come to terms with the fact that a Latin-based or a Latin extension alphabet doesn't work very well. And I think people are gonna go in two different directions. Um, one is to say, how can we add extensions to the Latin script or modify the Latin script to, uh, um, so that it better expresses um, the full range of sounds in our language. But I think some people are going to say, let's create our own script, which from the beginning is designed to do exactly that. Um, and as Kellen was saying, neither process is easy. Both processes are going to face political challenges because the Latin script is so associated with authority um, and with administration, that anybody who is in authority or is in administration doesn't want to have to learn another alphabet. Um, and they say things like, you know, we don't have any fonts, our printing presses aren't set up for it. This means that when we put up a notice, it's going to have to be in, in not just one or two languages, but four or five. Um, speaking of which, we need to end soon, but one of the things that only just occurred to me about two months ago is that um, if you are born and grew up in England, like I did, or in the United States, or in Canada, or in France, or Germany, or Spain, or Italy, you will only ever have to know one script. Whereas an educated person in India quite likely uses two or three or even four scripts every day. And apparently without dying in the process, their heads don't explode, right? I think the whole notion that everybody should use the same script, could only have been invented in a culture where everybody does use the same script because it seems such a challenge to, to, to use more than one. 
And one of the things that this made me realize the, the, the kind of the, the innate superiority of people growing up in South Asia is that you are perfectly happy with multiple scripts. It's not that much of a problem. Um, in the same way that people who grow up in indigenous communities in Indonesia are used to speaking several different languages. It's like, yeah. Um, I did a carving about six, seven years ago, um, which had a huge influence on me. I, it was for International Mother Language Day. And I contacted somebody that I had come to know in Indonesia. And I said, could you write the phrase mother tongue in as many different scripts of Indonesia? Because Indonesia has many different scripts um, so that I can carve them and we can display this on International Mother Language Day. And so he sent me 20, right? This is the phrase mother tongue in 20 different scripts. And so I got my piece of wood and I um, photocopied things and I sort of cut them up and I moved them around and I took a picture of it and I sent it back to him and I said, does this look more or less right? And he said, mm, let me do it for you. And what he did was to take those 20 scripts and rearrange them on the wood so that they also were in geographical connections with uh, you see, like suitable geographical groupings and script family groupings. And I thought this guy not only knows 20 times as many languages as I do, he's better at Photoshop than I am. And that's when I realized that um, the, uh, there was never any, any likelihood of me approaching people I work with with disrespect because I know that already you know more than I do. And it just so happens that the work that I do, there's nobody else to do it. But that will change one day. Maybe Callan will take over and, um, and then, you know, people will actually be learning from somebody who's, who's done this stuff. Anyhow, I think we need to, Manali, I think we need to, to wrap up. Um, it has been such a, a joy and a pleasure. Um, I uh, invite you all to get in touch with me. Um, you can go through the endangeredalphabets.com. There's a contact um, tab there. I would love to hear about the work you're doing and the difficulties and challenges you face. Um, I actually have, I have a, a, a grant proposal in for my new script incubator idea. And if anybody actually gives us um, some money for it, then I may come back to you and say, who is interested in taking part um, on a trial basis or a pilot basis uh, um, in, in this endeavor? Um, that would be probably over the next 12 to 18 months, I would think. Um, so I hope to hear from you. I hope to see you all again. Um, and once again, thanks so much for inviting me to join you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving us such an interesting talk to us. We have a very grateful and thank you so much. Uh, may I now invite Dr. Monali to kindly give a lot of thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bobita, for chairing the session for today. And we had such an uh, enlightening and enriching discussion uh, with um, Professor Tim Brooks. And um, I am pretty sure that our participants have learned so much, uh, so many things new, which we haven't uh, before uh, thought of on orthography development for our languages from this region. So thank you uh, once again, um, Professor Tim, for being a part of the Tiblanai lecture series today. And we definitely look forward to um, keeping in touch with you in the coming future. And we will definitely be in some or the other future collaborations very soon. Um, thank you once again. And I would like to make an announcement that we have a third lecture coming up on November 11, Friday at um, 6.30 or 7 p.m. We will confirm it to you once again after a week and the speaker will be Dr. Vijay D. Souza and he will be talking on Rusho Akka 
orthography, uh, the Archibald Burman language from Arunachal Pradesh. So um, I think um, before we end the session, we would like to take a group photo with um, Professor Tim Brooks and the uh, audience present here. So kindly turn your cameras on so that we can have one uh, group photo for this uh, session. Um, kindly turn your cameras on. Thank you so much. And um, we will have to leave the meeting soon because um, um, Professor Tim Brooks must be uh, in a very hectic schedule. So I think we will have to close the meeting and thank you once again. Have a pleasant day from India and good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.